Have you ever wondered how parents are adapted for helping the next generation survive? I'm a parent. I've invested time, effort, energy, money, and love in raising my offspring. I've also invested some of those same resources in helping my siblings raise my nephews and nieces. I've gone to some great lengths to make sure my kids are healthy and happy, as I'm sure many of you have too. But one thing I've never done, except maybe as a joke, is ask myself, why the heck am I doing this? But it's actually a pretty interesting question. Why would anyone want to be a parent? It's so hard. And the time and energy that we devote to our offspring have costs. I'm not just talking about financial costs, like the money you spend on braces and college tuition. I'm talking about the physical costs of reproduction and child rearing that are incurred by every living thing. All organisms have a limited amount of energy to carry out the processes of life. Processes like growth, respiration, movement, and yes, reproduction. Time and energy invested in one process means less time and energy available for another. Hey, look, there's a lot of food here, but there's also a lot of predators. I can eat my fill and get lots of energy at the risk of getting eaten. Or I can eat a little, move on, and have a better chance of living to eat another day. These selective pressures have a powerful effect on animal behavior and ultimately on how each species evolves to fit into its environment. As we saw in the previous lecture, an animal's reproductive strategies reflect these environmental pressures. Does the animal reproduce asexually or sexually? Does fertilization occur externally or internally? Do they have a lot of offspring at a time or only a few? In a related way, these selective pressures also affect parenting behaviors. Think about how humans reproduce and raise children. Humans give birth to a single baby about 97% of the time. It takes most babies a year to 18 months to walk on their own. And most of the time, we're carrying them around with us a lot longer than that. Talking takes at least as long as walking, sometimes longer. This investment in our offspring not only costs us energy, it gives us fewer opportunities to mate while we're raising our kids. So it reduces the number of offspring we can have, what zoologists call reproductive success. The benefit we gain from this investment is increased survival of our offspring. Humans are at one extreme of the parenting spectrum. We have very few offspring and we make an intense investment in each one. But in many other species, the mother and father don't help their offspring at all. This is most evident in explosively breeding species like corals and salmon. The human style of caring for offspring is an extreme example of what zoologists have called K-selection. The corals and salmon style has been called R-selection. The theory of R and K-selection is one of the simpler ways to describe why different animals have different parenting styles. To understand what these terms mean and how they emerge in a population, let's take a look at some invertebrates. Invertebrate parenting behaviors might surprise you. We might think that advanced care of offspring is indicative of advanced life forms like long-life crocodilians or birds and mammals. But caring for offspring occurs in crustaceans like lobsters, crayfish, and pill bugs, and in the scorpions and spiders. I've caught crayfish in my local creek and lobsters in a tidal zone that were carrying their egg clutches under their tails. Why do they do this? Crayfish and lobsters reproduce sexually. Maybe because of their hard exoskeletons, reproduction takes place while the female is molting. The pair copulates, and then the female partner releases her eggs. The eggs are fertilized as they travel from gonad to genital pore and out of her body. The sticky eggs get caught on fine bristles on her pleopods, the short fin-like appendages on her abdomen. These are also called swimmerettes. The eggs are carried for a few weeks to a few months, depending on the species, until the larvae, known as zoe, hatch and can swim on their own. In crayfish, 
eggs develop like this through the winter and subsequent spring. This is a period during which female crayfish do not eat. After hatching in May or June, young crayfish larvae live for a month attached to the female's pleopods. Throughout this period of care and protection of eggs and young, females also continuously fan and groom the eggs and hatchlings to provide ventilation and to remove waste. This is just one example of strong parental investment by crustaceans. So why would this happen? Why would crustaceans be so different from a coral or a salmon? Both salmon and lobster produce lots of eggs, so why do salmon leave the egg, le eggs and lobster protect them under their tails? In his book, Sociobiology, the renowned ecologist E.O. Wilson suggested an alternative to RK selection theory. He suggested that parental care is a response to ecological pressures. He also suggested that four particular issues factored into an animal's style of parental care. How stable is the animal's environment? How stressful is the animal's environment? How predictable are the resources in the animal's environment? And does the animal have any significant predators in its environment? When the environment is unstable, when it's stressful, when resources are unpredictable, and when predation is severe, Wilson argues that greater parental care should be a winning strategy. Based on Wilson's theory, we would expect that something in the environment in which crayfish evolved pressured these animals toward more parental care. And what about insects? Today's insects and crayfish evolved from a common crustacean ancestor over 350 million years ago. As insects moved from water to land, they faced some similar pressures for providing parental care as their water-dwelling ancestors faced. Most species of modern insects, however, avoid the cost of parental investment. Some female insects have sword-like appendages at the very back of their abdomens that are called egg depositors, called ovipositors. They use these to hide their eggs in or on vegetation, in crevices in bark, inside of a leaf, or some other place where the eggs are out of sight and away from egg predators. Most can use their ovipositors to place their eggs in small clutches, removed from one another in space and even in time. Entomology professor Douglas Tallamy, who studies insects in his backyard near the University of Delaware, suggests that for most insects, the opportunity to spread reproduction and egg clutches over time and space has made childcare both unnecessary and too costly for the possible benefit. But for those insects with fewer chances to breed, parental care can be the only way to ensure that their offspring live on after them. Some are selected species put up quite a fight in defense of their young. I've gone wading in ponds and watched small sunfish and bass attack my feet as I shuffled toward their shallow water nests. They fiercely defend these nest depressions in the pond bottom against other fish, so why not attack human feet? Mouth-brooding cichlids from Africa's Great Lakes take this parental defense behavior a step further. As a taxonomic family, this group of mouth-brooding creatures has been amazingly successful, filling almost every niche from sandy inshore areas to rocky drop-offs to deep water habitats, and their dietary habits match their habitat preferences. So they eat everything from underwater vegetation to insects and other fish. Many of these popular, colorful aquarium fishes are now endangered due to the introduction of predatory Nile perch into these African lakes in the 1950s. In recent years, scientists have discovered two other threats to the survival of cichlids. Growing human populations have caused more pollution to enter lakes. And this increased pollution brings nutrients with it, causing overproduction of oxygen-consuming algae. Cichlid populations have declined markedly since the turn of the 21st century. Many cichlid species are desirable as aquarium fish and even as food fish. Many species are territorial, laying their eggs in a nest scraped into the lake bed by parents who also guard the eggs. Others are mouth brooders of both their eggs and later their youngsters. During early stages of development, cichlid parents fan the eggs like crayfish do. 
Some species use their mouths to remove dead eggs, termed mouthing. Mouth brooding fish like tilapia usually have fewer and larger eggs than nest building fish, and certainly many fewer eggs than fish that spawn in open water, as you might expect. And mouth brooders eat less than the normal amount of food while they're brooding their young in their mouths, as we might also expect. It might reduce the chance that they accidentally swallow somebody special, right? The discus, a South American cichlid relative of angelfish and very popular aquarium fish that our aquarists have bred in the Smithsonian's National Zoo, goes even farther than the mouth brooders in my opinion. The discus is a spectacularly colored fish that is also camouflaged in the Amazonian freshwater environment. And their tiny, newly hatched young stay close to their parents. The young actually graze on the highly nutritious mucus coating on the adult's skin. Fortunately, my own daughters nourished themselves on peanut butter and jelly sandwiches when they were growing up. There's another factor to be considered when looking at parental care. Some babies are born relatively helpless, and some are born ready to take on the world. The words scientists have for these infant traits are altricial and precocial. The mothers or fathers of these infants have evolved reproductive physiology and behaviors to maximize the survival of their young. Altricial means immature and helpless at birth. And this word comes from a Latin root meaning to nourish, which references the need for extensive parental care. A precocial animal by definition is capable of a high degree of independence from birth. This word comes from the same Latin root as precocious. How does this play out in birds? Some birds, like robins, sparrows, and other perching birds, take lots of care of their young after hatching. It turns out that all perching birds hatch babies that are altricial. These little birds hatch with their eyes closed, have little or no downy feather covering, are not capable of departing from the nest for some time, and are fed by their parents. Ducks, shorebirds, and pheasants, on the other hand, are precocial. Their babies hatch with their eyes open, they're covered with down, and they leave their nest within a couple of days. Some of these precocial birds, like ducks, follow their parents after hatching, but find their own algae or insect food. Pheasant and grouse chicks, however, walk after their parents and are shown seed, leaf, and terrestrial insect food by the adults. Don't you wonder why these different modes of bird development have evolved? Scientists think they are tied to two important aspects of the bird's environment, food availability and predation pressure. The strategy of precociality emphasizes the ability of females to find abundant resources before laying eggs. Females of precocial species like ducks must produce energy-rich eggs to support the greater development of the chicks while in the egg. Eggs of precocial birds contain almost twice the calories per unit weight as those of altricial birds. Females in altricial species like robins do not face such large nutritional demands before egg laying. Instead, they need to find sufficient food to feed their helpless young through to fledging. Precociality is also a winning strategy in an environment where predators are common. Precocial young have some ability to avoid predation since they leave the nest early and are most often well camouflaged, and there is a much smaller chance of the whole clutch being preyed upon. On the other hand, while the altricial chicks are in the nest, the entire brood is very vulnerable to predation. So these species depend on nest camouflage and parental defense for survival. In fact, males and females take turns guarding the nest, so predation pressure affects the behavior of both parents, not just mothers. Behavioral ecologists like Professor John Alcock at Arizona State University use a cost-benefit approach to analyze why females usually provide more parental care than males. They suggest this is because females lay the eggs, so can expect to be genetically related to all offspring in their broods. Males who provide care incur a greater potential cost 
because they may be helping nestlings that were sired by themselves as well as by other males. Think about how these concepts play out within the mammal group. Which species come to mind as altricial and which as precocial? Well, think about domestic dogs and cats. Just like the family pet finds a dark and cozy place to nest before giving birth, carnivores in nature often use secluded dens in which to raise their young. The mothers feed their babies milk until they're ready to learn to hunt on their own. These are all characteristics of altricial young. Although we think of bears as impressively powerful animals, their babies are highly altricial. Bears have the largest adult to infant weight ratio in the placental mammal group, about 750 to one. Baby bears are born with eyes and ears closed, very little hair covering. They're not capable of moving out of the den and they need extensive parental care before they leave the den. And speaking of bears, can you think of an animal cuter than a baby giant panda? The difference in size between a 230 pound mother and her quarter pound baby is truly remarkable. The newborn baby is not so giant at 1 700th to 1 1,000th the weight of its mother. The National Zoo has been fortunate enough to be home to many baby giant pandas since 1972. All of them were adored by the staff and visitors alike, but perhaps none so much as Bebe, a male born in 2015. I was fortunate enough to be able to visit with little Bebe shortly after he made his public debut, and I spoke with one of his keepers, Marty Deary, about what it's like working with these wonderful bears. Marty, how long have you been working with giant pandas? So I've been working with the giant pandas about six years, and that includes getting a chance to travel to China back in 2013. So Bebe is pretty big now, but um, you guys watched Bebe, Bebe's birth. And um, Bebe was pretty small at birth. Yeah. How big are they in terms of weight? And what's the relationship between that size and the mother's size? Right, so the babies are really small. They're about one nine hundredth the size of mom. And uh, on average, they're about three to five ounces, somewhere in that region when they're born. So, so about small. the size of a butter stick? About the size of a butter stick. They're very, very tiny when they're born. You are so silly. <laughs> you are so silly. And how many cubs are there in a litter? Um, so there can be twins. Um, the, in, in the uh, zoo and sanctuary setting, we typically see about a 50-50 ratio of twins to singletons. Um, so anywhere from one to two. So in North American black bears, they can have up to five. In polar bears, they can have up to three. Do, do both of those twins survive in giant pandas? So there is some evidence that wild pandas can uh, raise twins. There's been some evidence of a female walking around with two cubs. And there was a, a den camera that actually saw a female with two cubs, and she raised them for quite a while. Um, in zoos, we typically um, actually swap the cubs, so we'll take one from mom and we'll let mom care for one while we care for the other, and then we swap them back and forth. Oh, sure. Uh, so each of them gets a chance to be with mom. He's being oh, a little nippy, so. Okay. Yeah. We won't let him nip What's me. What are you doing? What are you doing? And so pandas are mammals. Obviously, yeah. they raise their babies with milk. Yeah. How long does the mother nurse the baby before she weans it? So um, typically, cubs are nursed for up to a year and a half, maybe even two years. Um, obviously, at the beginning, they're being nursed every couple of hours, and now, even at this age, baby is only nursing about two times a day. It's a, it's a pretty short um, nursing session that he had. Each session is a little bit longer, but the qual quantity of nurses is only about two per day. Hey. Huh. So. You are being silly. He's He's being very rambunctious. He is being very rambunctious. So when does she wean Bebe, and then when will they separate? So typically, again, uh, weaning occurs at about a year and a half to two years, and that also, in pandas, weaning doesn't just mean you don't get milk anymore. It also means mom is going to separate from the baby. So she actually, we believe what happens in the wild is that the, the mother will push the baby away, um, because if you think about it, she needs to be able to get pregnant again. Um, so what we think happens in the wild is that over time, the animals start to spend a little bit less time together. They spend more time apart until finally, at some point, the mother chases the cub off. 
Uh, and how do you manage that here in a zoo setting? So the, the way we do that is, um, there's a couple of ways. The first is to give them choice to be separated. So there are times where Meishong will choose to go into a separate enclosure and leave him behind, which we're totally fine with. Um, as we start to get closer and closer to that year and a half, two year mark, we actually will start to physically separate them. So we'll shut a door between them. We usually do that for half an hour for a while until we see that they're comfortable. And we slowly expand that until the day that we finally decide today is the day that they're separated. And that's all based on mother cub interactions. We're not just randomly choosing it. It's we see that the mom is sort of ready to be done with the cub. Sure. So bears fascinate me. They're long <laughs> live. They're really smart. Uh, what are the most interesting interactions that you've seen between May and Bebe? So for me, the stuff that I find the most interesting is watching his development as he goes from this very tiny cub that can't do much for himself to being more of a bear. So now we see, at this age, we're starting to see a lot of play. So he'll come up behind his mom, he'll do what he's doing to me and grab a hold of me and try to bite. So biting, the biting that you're seeing, that's really just him trying to play. He's not trying to hurt me. Um, the difference is I'm not a bear, so I don't want to be bit by him. Um, but with his mother, he'll walk up behind her, he'll actually grab her by the ear, grab the hair on the back of her neck, and just start pulling on her because he just wants to play. And that's how bears play. And you know, play for a bear is sort of about learning how do I interact with bears in the wild. There's a lot right. of learning component to that, to that play. So for me, the play is the most interesting development to see. And do you guys try to facilitate that play in any way? Not usually, no. Um, that's he, he that's, that's initiated by Bay um, oh. on his own. He, he usually is the one to initiate. Meishon will occasionally initiate, especially when he was younger and couldn't move as much. You would see her like kind of nipping at him and doing a little bit of that. Um, but as they've gotten older, he tends to be more the initiator. May is very interested in play, but he tends to be the initiator. Wow. And so with every baby that's born, you guys continue your studies of behavior and reproduction. Absolutely, you know, this is now my second cub, um, and every time that we have a cub, I learn more and more about it. Uh, you know, we, we have behavior watchers that are watching these animals most of the day. Um, they're taking mother cub data, so they're kind of looking at what the mom and the cub are doing. So there's a lot of behavioral stuff that we do with these guys. Um, not only does it help general understanding of the species, but it helps us to manage this animal much better the more we know about them. Why do people think that Pandas are so cute. Um, the main reason is, at least this is the, the research that I've seen on this, is the, the theory that kind of humans are hardwired to like big heads. We, that's why our human babies, you know, they have these big heads. So our brain is kind of wired to find that cute. And if you look at a giant panda, they're pretty much all head, um, uh -huh. pretty massive head. And then there's big eyes. So even though his eye is, you know, it's not very big, those black circles make his eyes look huge. And that's another thing that people generally find really cute is those kind of big eyed animals. So that black circle around his eyes, that big head, that's the main reason people really find them cute. And what's the non-scientific answer for that question? They're kind of ridiculous animals. I mean, they <laughs> look, just look at them. I mean, when you watch them, the way they eat, the way they move around, um, you know, they're, they're, they get in positions that you don't think an animal like this should. They sometimes sit in a very human way, especially when they're eating their bamboo. So it's kind of that sort of stuff that we're looking at. That when, when I say that they're kind of ridiculous is the, the postures they get in. Where are we going? <laughs> what are we doing? Yeah, okay. You guys do really important work breeding endangered species here. Is this the most ridiculous job you've ever had? Sure. Um, yeah, so I mean, this job is, it's ridiculous, but in a good way, you know, I'm, one of a very select group of people that get to hang out with the, this amazing animal. Um, he was just sitting in my lap. I mean, I'm sitting in an enclosure with a bear. I mean, come on. So <laughs> it's this pretty is, fun. It's pretty fun. It's it's a lot of fun. And like I said, this 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 is something I've been doing. I've been a keeper for 14 years, um, but the last three or four years with these guys has been the best part of my career. Just all the work that's been put into breeding these guys and, and getting to interact with this cute little cub. <laughs> Isn't Bebe the cutest? As Marty and I discussed in there, giant pandas are born pretty altricial. Barely the size of a butter stick, they really can't do much without their moms. Precocial mammals, on the other hand, are able to move around on their own shortly after birth and have camouflage colors and cryptic behaviors to avoid predation while trailing their parents and nursing until they're capable of feeding on their own. Females of precocial species have longer gestation time 
and like all mammal females of reproductive age, need to maintain the best possible physical condition. There is certainly a continuum of precociousness, and you probably thought of hoofed mammals first among precocial mammals, because we know horses and antelope run after their mothers immediately after birth. One of the mammal group's most amazingly precocial species is the guinea pig. Instead of having a short gestation period like the altricial mouse, the guinea pig has a gestation that is longer than two full months. And its babies are born with eyes open, fully haired, and almost ready to eat on their own. And the reward for this is offspring that are ready to breed before the next litter is born. Males and females may each be sexually mature before they reach the age of two months. Altricial and precocial infant strategies both have their evolutionary advantages. Each strategy depends on the species' environment, nesting habits, predator-prey relationships, and feeding strategies. One of the most amazing examples of unique parental care in mammals is, I think, in golden lion tamarins. Only around 2,000 of these small reddish-orange monkeys remain in the Atlantic coastal forests west of Rio de Janeiro. Smithsonian's National Zoo and others began a conservation breeding program for this beautiful species in the 1970s, and adults had problems raising their twin young. This species eats low-calorie insects and tree gum in their native forest habitat, and probably even get their water from bromeliads in the trees. And parents need to carry the youngsters around for protection, rather than leaving them in their tree cavity nests. The mother expends a lot of energy on lactation, and it is common for the male to carry the twins. And the adult golden lion tamarins are the first ones out of their nests in the morning, and the last ones to go into the nest each night. These lovely little relatives of ours put a lot of energy into raising their young. National Zoo scientist Dr. Deborah Kleiman and her students studied golden lion tamarind behavior and found that the family group benefits from subadult helpers, like human teenagers babysitting the kids. And it turns out that the helper time in the family group helps the teenagers become better parents when they have babies of their own. It was only after Dr. Kleiman and her colleagues figured this out and replicated this social grouping in zoos that we could reintroduce golden lion tamarins into newly protected habitat in Brazil. And now their future looks brighter. Survival of all these species depends on us, on humans' conservation of the environment and critical habitat elements needed for the species' survival and reproduction. All of us, humans and other species, evolved unique parental care independently due to different pressures of the environment on natural selection.